afterwards. Okay, recording is on. We have 14 folks in the waiting room. We're going to admit everybody, and it's going to be a great time. Welcome, everyone. I'm seeing some familiar faces. I am really excited to have you all here today. We are going to dive right in, um, which is a little different than our normal, like, music jam session getting settled um so hey y'all i am kelsey i am your senior program manager and curator of the equity and justice and collective giving webinar series um we i'm so 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 excited to have um, the u.s federation of worker cooperatives here um, as always, if you need closed captioning, you can just click the little box that has the CC in the bottom of your screen. This session is going to be recorded today and we'll share it out with you all. Um, and then finally, um, as always, we love to see your faces. So if you want to come off cam on camera, we would love to see that. It helps our facilitators gauge energy level. Um, and with that, I just want to give a big thank you to Kellogg, who is the group that allows us to put on these amazing webinars. Um, and so, again, I cannot stress to you all how excited I am for this session. I've literally had it on my bucket list for the two and a half years that I've been at Philanthropy Together. And with that, I'm going to throw it to our amazing facilitators, um, and we will start with Destiny. So, Destiny, take it away. Hey, thanks so much, Kelsey, and thank you, Kellogg. And thank you, Philanthropy Together community, for inviting us to be here. My name is Destiny Lee. I use share pronouns, and I'm the training consulting manager here at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. You may also hear me say just the Federation or USFWC. I mean the same thing, but just um, that's me. I live in North Carolina on Kiowa and Sisapaha Native Territory. And today's workshop is going to be led by me and Maureen, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague to introduce themselves. Thanks, Destiny. Hey, everyone. I'm Maureen. I use she, her pronouns. I also work at the Federation, and I feel you every time I say the Federation, I feel like I'm referring to some side of thing. Um, I live in northern New Mexico in Ogapoe territory in Santa Fe. And we invite any of y'all who haven't done so yet to introduce yourselves via the chat. Um, if you want to share your name and your pronouns, where you're coming from, and if you could throw in a tidbit of the size of your giving circle, we'd love to know. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, I suppose to introducing themselves, we also just want to give a big shout out to Jamie, who is also part of our team and he's here doing tech support. Um, and Jamie, if you could bring up those slides, that would be nice. There goes Jamie. <laughs> Um, as we get the slides up, you'll see them. And these slides also will be shared with you all through Kelsey in a PDF version. So when you're like, I want these slides later, you're going to have them. You can go to the next slide, Jamie. And let's just share a bit about the Federation in case, if you didn't know about U.S. Federation Worker Cooperatives, maybe drop a one in the chat just so we can gauge if this is a bit new for folks. But if not, um, the U.S. Federation Worker Cooperatives is the only national grassroots membership organization of a worker cooperatives in the U.S. Our mission is to build a thriving cooperative movement of stable, empower, of stable empowering jobs through worker cooperatives as well as we want to advance worker-owned, manage, and govern workplaces through cooperative education, advocacy, and development. Wonder if I'm seeing any ones in the chat. No, but I'm seeing some people drop their intros. Glad well, to see that. See some folks have the different circles. Chicago in here, San Francisco, in sizes of one to maybe seven, ranging at the moment. Good to know. Um, let's go to the next slide, Amy. That's us again. Hey, y'all. <laughs> next one. And let's get into what are we going to be talking about? How are we spending our time together today? 
So we're in our welcome and icebreaker, which we're going to be playing a game soon. Look forward to it. And then we're going to be talking a bit about like values, decision making components, history and framing. And we're going to be presenting about decision making models used by cooperatives. And then we'll close our one hour together. That would be our time for today. Speaking of icebreaker and game, it's time. So I invite folks to come on camera if you want some play. And we're going to play a, a quick round of Pass the Dance. What this is going to entail is folks that are on camera, if you could use the raise hand function. And how you can you do that is if you go to reactions, depending on what your Zoom, how your Zoom is updated, you can go to reactions and go to um, raise hand and it'll create a stack. And so through the stack, we'll just pass the dance to whoever is actually in the stack. So one person will make a dance move and then they'll see the person that raised their hand and they'll call on that person. And then that other person will mirror that person's dance move and then pass it. Can we model this, Maureen? Yeah, okay, cool. I gotta see the dance move again. <laughs> I got you. All right, go cool. So Jamie, our DJ for the moment, is gonna put us on some music, but not now, but once you have the music, I'll do a dance move. And then I'm gonna pass it to Maureen. Maureen will copy my dance move, do another dance move with the shimmy shimmy, and then pass it to someone else. Okay, we got this, clear instructions. Okay, if you wanna play, I encourage you to raise your hand. We're gonna probably pass the dance maybe like four times. All right, Chloe, we love a risk taker. <laughs> um, okay, Jamie, can you get us some music going? Okay, this is our dance move. I'm passing to you, Chloe. We pass into Chloe. I'll pass into Christina. I miss the flow completely. <laughs> I remember this part. I got that part. But Christina, who are you passing it to? This was your last move, right? Christina, you're on you're muted. <laughs> Pass it to Sarah. Oh, sweet. I already forgot the move. What was the move, Christine? Okay. Okay. Like the addition. That's going to be our last move, y'all. Thanks for entertaining. And I hope for the folks that didn't join that you got some laughter from the, the play. And thanks, Jamie, for holding our tech. Let's move forward. Are we that far forward? Can we go back maybe if? Okay, that is where we are. Um, okay, so right now it's on our history and framing. So I'm gonna pass it to Maureen. Hey, Jamie, would you mind pulling up the next slide after this one? Thank you. So we were curious uh, about, I saw there's a pretty wide variety of the number of people participating in your giving circles. And I was curious if you could take a few moments just to reflect on these questions and either come off mute or put in the chat, what process do you currently use to make decisions? Um, I'm assuming that the, ma the major decision in your mind is who to grant the funds that you have available to. So. I gave some options, maybe you use a nomination process, maybe you have an open application. And then when you actually go through the decision-making, do you tend to just go through a deep discussion? Do you have a specific system for voting? Do you strive for consensus? A lot of you already answered how many people are in your giving circle. 
Um, so if you could just take a second and let me know where you're coming from. I'm curious to see the spectrum of practices that are already at play that we're going to be building on today. And again, you can come off mute, you can drop it in the chat and thanks. I can talk. <clears throat> we use, um, a no any member can nominate a nonprofit. Um, and then from there, um, we, anyone, then we vote. Uh, the top three organizations, um, whoever nominated them, so whatever member nominated them, presents about that nonprofit, tries to present a compelling case as to why the money should go to them, and then it's ranked voting after that. Thank you for sharing. I had one follow-up question to that. Do you have any parameters in your circle to make sure that those who end up in the top three have, like, cover a spectrum or any kind of equity check or no it's something we're relatively new we've only been around for a year so it's um we're still trying to figure it out the biggest thing is that we didn't want to put the um, burden on the nom the nonprofits themselves in terms of having to fill out the applications or do any of the due diligence so all of that has to be done by the members themselves that's great to hear thank you for sharing and I see in the chat from Christina that there's another process of doing a nomination and then a meeting to choose the top ones and then a poll to all members since not all attend the in-person meetings. And they nominate based on issue area priorities that are decided first. And then I see another mix from Sarah of nominations, ranked choice voting, consensus, and distributed votes. And then, wow, I'm surprised by how many of you are cooking with hot sauce with consensus here. We start with consensus and move to voting as needed from Chloe. And we have an application process and the participants review the application and then decide how much to award to each awardee from Crystal. That's great. This is really going to transition well into the models that the co-ops are um, providing for this session today. So my next set of questions is on the next slide. If you could move it, Jamie, thank you. This is just, you can share if you want, um, but this is more to align yourself uh, in regards to this session. What are you hoping for out of the next hour? Um, why are you interested in deepening the democracy in your space? Um, I'm impressed you're not just trying to seize power. And then what problem are you trying to solve if you've been coming up against a problem like um, ties or conflict or a lack of engagement and Keep these answers in mind, and then at the end of the session, hopefully let us know if, if it addressed them. But if there's anything that feels pressing, feel free after taking a minute or so to put it in the chat or let us know out loud what you're hoping to learn today. I'll just give you a minute to let it rock and you can think about it. And I will say I'm particularly curious if you're coming up against a problem with the process you're using. I'd like to know. And the last thing I'll say is I just want to affirm that even if you are hitting problems in your giving circle, um, I think that quite a bit of things we do in our everyday life are democratic and you already have solutions and other practices in your life, like whether it's sharing car with your neighbors or coordinating meal plans with your friends or um figuring out how to share any collective resource in your neighborhood. There's plenty of implicit ways we've learned to cooperate and get to a shared understanding and a shared decision. But the places we tend not to experience the most democracy, depending on the structures we grew up in and engage in, are with your family and at work. Um, there tends to be a lot more hierarchy in those spaces. But there are examples that you can draw on from if you've ever successfully gotten a group thread to a conclusion, um, and we'll bring that into the examples from the co-op movement. I'm gonna check the chat and see what y'all are saying. Perfect. So Sarah says, we're always looking for ways to ensure everyone in the room feels seen and heard. Evan says, I hope we can understand more that we're in a society together and that you just wanna learn how to give more agency and ownership to groups. 
you're going to like what comes next. Um, and Chloe says our issue is trying to balance the informal nature of our circle with the need to have a process that draws people in and doesn't just get driven by the more vocal opinions. But you're going to like what comes next too. Dang, are you plants in the audience? <laughs> I'm kidding. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I'm going to pass it to Destiny to take us through the framing of what values um, and what pieces make up the components of a decision. And then like she shared, we'll get into the examples from co-ops and ways to address some of the problems you raised. Thanks. Yes, I was good to know from you all where you are in your decision-making processes. So I have a question for you, it's on here. Um, what is a decision? If you haven't already read the slide, we can drop in the chat your definition of like, what is a decision and what do you think decision needs? Um, if you have read it, that's all cool. I'm gonna tell you anyway, that's what we're here for. So what is a decision? A decision is the time that you are taking and selecting a course of action or belief. Very simple said, but also hard to define as well as hard to make sometimes. So it is important to have a streamlined process for everyone that understands um, or being asked to make a decision. And Maureen is going to educate us in some examples of a streamlined process for decision making soon. Additionally to that, we want to make sure that we're resourcing our decisions. Ways that we resource our decision are thinking about time, we're thinking about access, and we're thinking about values. I'm going to touch a bit more about the time. We're thinking more about both. We're going to stay here on this slide, but we're thinking more about the time before the decision making process for prep of like, do folks really have time to prepare before they're being asked to make a decision? Do folks have the time to review the materials enough to be able to make an informed decision? Making sure folks do not feel rushed. Like what is the level of urgency here? And do people feel like they have enough time to be able to speak in this space? Really thinking about different ways for people to process information. And when we think about values, we're gonna get into that in just a moment a little more, but wanting to just really emphasize that um, resourcing part around time. Maureen, before we go to, you already know where we're going next, but <laughs> before we go into like different parts about the decision-making process, is there any more that you wanna add to the resourcing a decision before I move forward? I appreciate that. Yeah, I would say, there's often, at least in the work we do with worker cooperatives in this country, tech barriers that you can create um, a portal or a website or a, a software access point for posting notes and for getting things on a group chat. But um, it's always worth just checking in, is the place where we're having the conversation working? And that's part of access. Like, does everyone know how to open this document, how to use this platform, how to communicate? Um, because often people won't come forward and say it, you'll just notice a dip in engagement. And similarly to what Destiny just said, if people don't have time to make a prepared uh, choice, they they might rather just not make a choice. So if you're if you're watching that the engagement around a decision is low, those are places to check. Did they have the time to understand it? Were they able to access the information? And then did they feel like it was worth their time to engage with? Thanks, Destiny. Sure thing. So those are the parts that we want to think about when we're resourcing a decision. Now let's get a bit, Jamie, if you can forward the next slide, into how we're making informed decisions. These are some bullet points, but I'm going to briefly touch over them as you read over the slide, if you do. Um, so starting with why. Why is really depending on your giving circles values. What are the values that you have as a group? I was hearing about making the most compelling argument um, for why we want to go forward with a nonprofit. I don't remember who said that, but I know that that was just said. Thank you to who said that. I'm quoting you. Um, and, and that can be depending on like, okay, great. How aligned is that to our North Star, our long-term vision as an organization? How is that aligned with us as a giving circle and our mission? So that's really giving like that, that why, your values, your principles as an organization, the vision you're creating, the kind of impact you're wanting to land. When we're thinking about who, 
We're wanting to know who is leading. Is it inclusive? And are the folks that are leading the most impacted by the decision that's being made? Something here of a facilitation tip is practicing progressive stacking. So say for instance, you are having a conversation and um, we're, we're talking about, I don't even know what we're gonna be talking about. Let's talk about mm, food insecurity. That's just one of the causes I care about. <laughs> and when we talk about food insecurity, we, we really wanna know about the folks that are living um, and are really gonna be voicing their opinions that don't have access to food that don't have a thousand mile radius to them for like a, a healthy grocery store or usually have to be urban farmers or wherever the case may be. But we want to hear first about them than someone that does have um, grocery stores readily available to them and healthy food options. So it's just really about like first making sure the folks that are mostly infected are contributing to the decision that's being made. We also want to know who designed the question that decision is being answered to? For example, who from the question of how we're gonna spend the $5,000 on a group? Uh, was it one group or was it five? Did the community ask for this deeper investment? Who's really bringing forward the ask at this moment? Or was this a broader investment? As well as thinking about the community, we wanna to continue to think of like, how are we prioritizing and who are we prioritizing these funds for? And who created the values that the decisions are being based on? That was definitely quite a bit in the who. And just really wanting to make sure to summarize this, that is the folks that are mostly impacted, that is inclusive, and that we're also thinking about who has the voting power for this particular decision. And we're thinking about voting power. We're going to get a bit in this win. So let's transition there. When are the due dates for the feedback? Right? And we want to think about still this level of urgency that we have or we don't have, preferably not ideally, because we want folks to be able to make an informed decision. Referring back to what Maureen was just sharing about who has access. We're, like Maureen has shared, and I, I'm going to just briefly repeat, it's like, do they have access to the Google document? If we're going to be reaching folks, I, I remember in different examples of my own local organizing, some folks may not read the Google document or check their emails. It may be a phone call type of people. Um, you know, like, are we reaching them in the ways that are inclusive or is it just like a monolith of like, we're gonna reach everyone in one kind of way? Um, so those are some things to be considering. And in that when, we really want to know, like, are we being, when, when is the due date for the feedback, but also are we being asked for advice or are we being included for shared decision making? Because there we all know that there's a difference between just like, what's my opinion or can, and how can I influence, um, well, that's a bit of the how, but <laughs> when can I influence the decision making? And Moving on over naturally and organically to the how. We want to think about how are people giving the feedback? Still repeating, repeating, because it's really important about the accessibility of that method. We also want to think about, hmm, is this information, like think about how transparent this decision is. Is this public information that's going to be announced to the community? And and those kind of announcements can be like an info session that folks are coming to. We also want to consider are the groups or people who are rejected informed about why? And if you do this already, that's a great practice. And if not, I want to invite you to think about it so that they can strengthen their application process for the next time that they're applying. And we can think of this as optional but there's some advantages for you to do this. The advantages of it are building trust as well as improving equity, especially if there's a the reason that the group may have gotten rejected with something that's around like skill-based reasons so that they can shift in themselves and be able to apply in the future and have a better chance for that impact.
we want to also be thinking about how are people being engaged over and over again and will that impact change we want to think about what are the different these are different things to be frameworks as well as considerations to have like what's just the desired outcome from this decision process that we're making what is the desired outcome at the beginning what are you hoping for as again as well as i think about the group's dynamics ideally we want folks to leave in a in a manner that we still like each other after making a decision so like let's try to foster that in the way that we are communicating. And that could be the way of communication, the way of like urgency, um, but just really thinking also about that desired outcome and the power dynamics that, that could be at play when we're making a decision across um, from members to, to funders, um, but there's a variety. And as well as just like, who is the audience? Make sure you're considering your audience as well when we're making a decision. That's a, a snippet here, the, the why, the who, the when, and how. And I want to invite Maureen, if there's anything you wanted to add before we move forward. I'll just say that I find a lot of inspiration in the way that cooperative lenders engage with worker cooperatives. When businesses are applying for capital or a loan um, with traditional banking systems, it's uh, a lot of stress going into that application and no guarantee and not often transparency about why they were rejected. And a lot of the terms for why they're rejected are outside their control. And in the cooperative movement, cooperative lenders, which are worker-owned um, financial institutions, will approach the application with the goal of getting you to a point where they feel confident giving you a loan. Um, or giving you a grant. And that perspective really shifts the engagement. And like Destiny said, it's it's building in their mission of saying our goal is to finance worker cooperatives as a sustainable option in this country. And they're inclusive in that they walk through the process of how to apply and accommodate the application to the group that's applying. And they have a really generous timeline for getting you ready. It's not on their timeline of grant cycles. It's on your timeline of getting to a place where your business plan is stable. And then they do impact assessments of how their loans are affecting the co-op movement and whether or not the barriers to application are the correct ones. Um, but again, those barriers are set as a as a safety measure for the group applying for the loan to say like, often co-op lenders will say, we need to see these types of financial reports to know that you'll be able to pay this back, but also to know that you'll be able to invest it well because you have a healthy democracy in your workplace and you'll be able to get through those decisions together. So I think there's a lot to offer from the co-op movement. I'm grateful to this space that you've given Destiny and I, um, and I'd be happy to get into it if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jamie. And thank you, Destiny. So we'll be going through two decision-making models today that are really um, often used with co-ops or by no means the only ones, but I think they'll address some of the specific flags that came up in the chat. The first one um, is called sociocracy. And actually, before we get any further, I just want to check because I saw Destiny did this. I really admire this. Can you just raise your hand if you have no idea what a worker-owned co-op is and this is your first time even hearing that string of words? Is there anyone who feels, you can raise your hand if you feel like you couldn't, you couldn't string together a sentence about it, but you're curious to learn if this whole idea of co-ops is, is brand new. Well, that's exciting. All right, then we can keep going. Uh, but if you change your mind and you realize you don't know what's going on. Oh, I see one. All right. Good job. It's scary. I, I uh, will give a brief definition, which is to say the Federation serves uh, worker-owned co-ops because it's a fairly novel model in the States, but it has a long history in the global South. And the way we define a co-op is a business owned and controlled by its workers. And it's a values-driven business, which is why a lot of the frameworks used in co-ops are um, useful for decision-making because co-ops overall make their decisions from a set of principles and they center worker benefit and community benefit at the core of their purpose. And the way that they do it is through a democratic decision-making model of one member, one vote, in which the workers participate in the financial success of the business through profit sharing and the strategic direction of the business through representation on the board. 
And any worker co-op can have employees that aren't owners. Um, if they so choose, they can leave that as an open employment class. But a core principle of worker cooperatives is that every everyone who works for the co-op should have a defined path towards ownership if they want to own the place they work. So with that, I'll take it to sociocracy and you'll see how this uh, crazy thing works because <laughs> it's it sounds nuts, no bosses, but it's pretty beautiful and it doesn't mean you can't have structure. So if you could go to the next slide, Jamie. So the word sociocracy is a mouthful, um, but what it means is socios, those who associate together, govern together. And I promise I'll get into the nitty gritty, but to just stay in the, like the, the dreamy meta stuff for a second, why do we talk about governance at all? Because it's happening all the time. Um, it's not just in formal spaces where it's happening. Like Destiny said, there are power dynamics at play that dictate the ways we relate to each other. And the ways that those dynamics play out is either through conditioned habit um, or meaningful intentions that were set. And if you replicate the structures um, that don't serve us, you'll replicate the outcomes. You'll replicate the classism and racism we see in so many environments where governance and hierarchies in place. And just to give a note on structure versus process, we're gonna get into both, but typically we think about structure like if you imagine information flowing, the structure is how it flows. Does it go through a series of little gates of people? Um, does it go through, like Destiny was referencing, uh, phone calls? Does information flow through tech platforms? Does information flow through meetings? Do you have to be in the meeting to access the information? Like someone said, they uh, let the members participate even if they're not in person. And then process is more about how we communicate and decide. So once you're in the structure, what's the process for participating in the structure? So in the next slide, you'll see a lot of circles. Don't panic. <laughs> um, sociocracy is a lot of circles. So the major thing I'll say is that sociocracy has a few guiding principles, which are to decentralize decision-making um, and empower people to take on the scope of work they feel comfortable taking on so sociocracy does have, as you see in this center, a coordinating circle, um, which has one member from every other smaller circle that radiates out. But instead of centralizing decisions in that coordinating circle, the goal is always to pass them back out into smaller and smaller groups and empower the smaller groups to make a decision in their space. Lots of circles, lots of arrows, but it actually does flow relatively fluidly. So when we talk about structure as the way that information moves, it's designed for information to move effectively. So imagine the coordinating circle decides we have a decision. If anyone um, feels like offering a decision, an example of a decision you'd make in a giving circle, we can run it through these circles. Does anyone wanna put in the chat or come off mute and just say like a recent decision you had to make? And it can be as simple as like, what day are we meeting? Or as complex as how do we choose between these two groups? Go ahead, Michael. Thanks. At fourth generation, we uh, just a couple of weeks ago had to make a final decision amongst which organizations we are gonna reach out to for, or who are gonna be getting funding. Um, and so, yeah, that was a decision. And to clarify, you're saying which organizations you're going to reach out to to invite them to apply? No, sorry, I misworded that. I tripped on my own words. We we decided which organizations we were going to fund, uh, but we haven't actually decided the amounts yet. We do a little more deeper dive into that final list before deciding amounts. That's honestly a perfect example. So in the coordinating circle, um, as you can see, there are a lot of circles here because sociocracy scales. Um, you can have as many circles as people self-determine they need. So in the coordinating circle, first you identify the decision. And in the case of Michael's giving circle, it's how much are we going to fund each of these groups? And then you try to push those decisions out. So you could determine a sub-decision is figuring out um, 
the budget of each group. And then you could form, say, four smaller circles, those slightly darker gray ones, uh, one focused on each group, just doing research on their financial needs and um, what they typically spend in a year. Or you could divide not based one circle, one group's research, but every circle is going to be doing a different type of research. So all four circles would be looking at the same, say, four finalists, but the circles would have different aims. Maybe one would be doing um, a review of last year's grants to see whether or not there was an amount that was too small to make an impact to develop a bottom threshold, or reaching out to similar groups and trying to get a broad uh, set of understandings of what kind of budgeting would be impactful. You could have a group that's just doing direct outreach, that's um, following up and saying, what would um, what would your preferred range be? And like one to two projects, even over the phone, um, that you think you could accomplish. And like we have these three thresholds and just reaching out to the groups directly. A group could just be doing um, a, say, like an industry study. And it just depends, going back to the questions that Destiny was raising up, how much you want the groups to be involved in the building and determining of how much money they can carry. Um, what's an effective scale for the programs they're trying to do? And this is something that co-ops see often, where when they're going through a, a process of technical assistance or training with the Federation, they might come in saying what we really need is a truck and what we determine through giving time and space to that conversation is that they're actually experiencing internal conflict and someone stopped lending their car the way they used to and there's been a transition in terms of availability of being able to bring things to market and so the truck is a symbol of a different problem so if there is space to really flesh out like what is the group looking for and why the smaller giving circles can take that time or sorry the smaller sociocracy circles can take that time and do it but something really important to note is that once a decision is pushed out of the coordinating circle into a smaller circle, it's double linked, uh, which means there's always someone from the coordinating circle in the smaller circle. There's always someone from the smaller circle in the coordinating circle, just so it's never reliant on one person and one person's interpretation of the conversation. It's a two-way check. And it's a way to make sure information's coming in and out without needing two full convenings of two circles. Every circle can say, you know what? We don't need all eight of us to do this. And then subdelegate again. You can form as many subcircles as you want. But the key thing to recall here, if this is your first time seeing it, this is new information, every circle is empowered to carry out their area of work, however they see best. So this is a real attack on like micromanaging or centralizing power. It's saying once you've entrusted an aim or a purpose to a circle, let them do it. And there's built-in waves of evaluation and feedback in this process. But like, let people run the process, come to a decision with the group that's selected that they want to be part of that decision. And then they bring it back to the coordinating circle as an information share to say, this is what we decided in our space. Um, and if there's any flags or objections, there's a process for integrating them. So the major reason that I think sociocracy serves co-ops and may serve you all is that whenever there's a broad decision, there's usually a ton of sub-decisions within it. And allowing different people to take on different types of work and identifying the sub-decisions or the information that would need to be answered so you could feel like you're making an informed choice really can be delegated out. And it allows people to try on different roles. So it's not just one person always reviewing, um, I don't know, doing the in-person interviews or the site visits, people, when they understand what the role is and have an option of being in these smaller circles, can learn from people who have held the role before. And it's a way of constantly training you and exposing you to new roles in the organization for different types of decisions so you don't get siloed as a member of the giving circle to be the one that always writes the emails afterwards or always makes the phone calls or um, depending on how in-depth you go with like feasibility studies or whatever level of support you provide to the groups you're granting, it's a way to rotate what decisions you're a part of because you're not fixed. It's not like my name is Maureen and I'm a member of subcircle F. The circles arise and fall just based on the decision at hand. 
And it's my choice what level of depth in the decision making I want to have. Do I want to be informed about it and just be in the coordinating circle? Or do I really want to get into it with a few of my colleagues in one of the smaller circles? And then usually there's a mission circle, um, no matter what the decision is, that just make sure we're not forgetting the big picture. And that is sometimes an invitation to outsiders from the group um, to sit in either stakeholders or past, in your case, it could be past recipients, to just do like a, a little check on the process, hear the reports back from the smaller circles and say, this is how it's landing based on what I know. Um, and if objections arise, this brings us to the next slide, which is what are the major ways that um, you go through these circles to, to kind of clear up the roadblocks. This is an example of what it could look like, the general circle or coordinating circle, um, and the departments could be, in your case, they wouldn't necessarily be called departments, they could be called like a finance focus or an impact focus or a partnership focus to see um, how rooted and supported the group is if they are to get the financial gift. And then every group can determine the smaller amounts of groups, but all groups will have a similar process. So the, the major points they try to hit are nobody can be ignored. Um, this option requires everyone to engage in some circle, but not only that, it uses a process called rounds, which means that everyone speaks one by one. We didn't do this to you today, but we could. Um, the idea is that you practice inclusion in every moment. So it helps people who typically would tend to sit back in a meeting and observe, familiarize themselves with just speaking, even if the expectation is to just say, I heard what you said and I understood it and I have no questions. Every meeting, everyone speaks. Um, so it addresses one question of what's that person thinking who keeps coming but never sharing. Um, and the other thing that's important about rounds is any objection that's voiced um, is the parameters that you give for that People can make objections to the, the way the decision's moving with the goal that the circle can't achieve its aim. So if your circle's been tasked with figuring out um, which organization that you grant funds to will have the greatest impact on housing security, and you get to a point where you're like, I object, we, we're not ready to make this decision. Speaking back to what Destiny shared about, do we have the time and information to make an informed decision? You can make that objection, but it's towards not saying, I disagree with your choice. No context. It's saying, this is the task of what we're here to do. And my objection is that I think the way we're going, we're not going to do it, or we're not going to do it well. So it can be, I disagree with your choice, but the context is, I disagree with your choice because it's not going to meet our aim. And then you go through rounds until the objection's been integrated into shifting the decision that comes out of your circle and moves back up to the general circle. So it's a distributed authority, and it's really important you know who decides what. Um, this is a lot of circles, fewer arrows on this slide, but let me know if I'm losing you. So far, does it seem to make sense? The big circle to the medium circle to the small circle, I see some thumbs up. Nobody's hung up yet. <laughs> cool. Then the last thing I'll share about this is that it's less hierarchical, as you can probably see. And I see your question, Michael, I'll call on you in a sec. Um, but it is more structured. So there's a learning curve to using this. Um, there's a learning curve to using rounds because there are people who are not accustomed to speaking and sharing their opinion. And this model really heavily encourages full participation. And part of that is the evaluation cycle because it's focused on improvement over time. So not only do you have um, your aim and your circle, but you have an idea of how you want to be as that little circle making a decision. You'll carry out that decision, and then usually there's a built-in timeline of when you'll give feedback about what it was like to work together before you disband the circle. Some sociocracy groups end every single meeting with an evaluation, like how to go to meet today, how to go to do rounds today. Did you find that you were holding something back? Did you find that it really helped you let go of something that's been really stressing you out once you voiced it to the team. Um, but there's just two points where I'd really encourage doing rounds if you can't manage to do them all and you just want to adopt some aspects of this. I would say in the check-in before you start a meeting, before you start a conversation that's going to be heavy about making a tough decision, just make sure everyone says how they're doing. <laughs> um, 
I think the level of engagement in a check-in can vary, but it's still useful. You would be surprised how well people hold it together, but might be coming to the meeting with bad news or they might be very distracted. And a check-in question I like to do in those moments of, prior to a heavy decision is, does everyone feel prepared to make it today? Like just where are you at? Were you able to read the materials? Do you know what we're talking about? Are you able to stay the full time? Are you hungry? <laughs> Do you know where the bathroom is? Like, are you good to focus on this conversation in a healthy way where you're going to bring your best? Are you irritable? Like what's going on? Do you have a migraine? Do you want to turn off the overhead light? Like get to the place where before you get into the meat of it, as best as possible, you understand people's limitations and needs and try to address them. Um, and now I'll kick it to Michael who had a question because I'm curious what it was. And then we'll shift to the second model co-ops use and I'll compare them. Thanks. Um, I love all of this. Um, I'm an operations guy, so my brain goes right away to logistics. And so I'm wondering, do you think like it would be worth having one of the department circles be like a logistics circle? Because I imagine coordinating all of this requires a lot of work. Or do you think that's better to be part of the general circle? Just curious. These are good questions. It depends on the skills in your team. So typically, um, I'm sure some of these roles are not new to you. Most of them might be familiar to you. In each circle, they have a set of roles. They'll have a circle secretary who's taking notes, which is pretty important for when a decision's been made, making sure everyone knows what it was. So you don't leave the meeting going, I think we said we're doing this. And then two weeks later, continue to misremember the memory until it's a whole different decision. The secretary really holds like the organizational truth of where you're headed and is a reference point uh, for answering questions and clearing up conflict. There's usually a facilitator. Um, there's usually a leader who's not the facilitator, but the circle leader sits in on the general circle. So there is a structure to be borrowed if you want to borrow it from sociocracy for who's at the minimum what three roles are filled in each circle. And the reason the leader isn't the facilitator is because they have different um, different areas of focus. The leader is focused on what information do I need to bring back out? And the facilitator is focused on what's happening right now. Are we honoring the values we set out? Are we honoring our time? You can divide that into a facilitator and a timekeeper. But the more you delegate those responsibilities, the better. And I'd say for the sake of the circles going well, it might be beneficial to let each circle determine what they need to meet. Like Destiny was saying, one group might just have their meetings on the phone. One group might really need just like a whole day to come together. One group might want to do that but need childcare, at which point you could form a smaller circle just to coordinate childcare. But the idea is that sociocracy like bubbles up in response to the work that's identified as as you're doing the work. So if you get to a point in the conversation where you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, like we're gonna be at this for seven hours and none of us have food, you know, that might be something you identify as a pattern in your giving circle and then you can pop off a logistic circle just to coordinate food at meetings. But there's no one size fits all. It's a very adaptive um, organic structure. And it's just about when you identify work, you pop off a new circle and the people who are ready to take that work forward are given the authority to do it the power to do it, the access to do it. So whatever that entails for the decision at hand. And I think it's interesting to shift from this to the fist of five. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Jamie, if you thought you were, so oh, my bad. So there's one more thing I'll say. Uh, Co-ops tend to make decisions based on seven principles of cooperativism. This is the idea that like all co-ops, no matter what their industry, their size, their location, they're striving for the same thing. And part of the reason I think sociocracy lends itself to the co-op movement is because one of the values of co-ops, there's seven principles and we share them at the end, um, is democratic member control. And this model allows for a broad spectrum of what it means to control. Sometimes people panic um, when they're like, I don't want to decide everything about everything. Like, when, especially when we do conversions where it's a traditional business that the owner is going to sell to the employees. And they're like, I'm good at my job. I don't also want to do his job and her job and their job. And this model allows you to have control, but kind of opt in to what levels and what depth. And then principle five is that a co-op's committed not only to internally educating and training its, its members and providing them with information, 
but to educating and training the community about cooperativism and the way it shifts our economy and our culture. So the giving circle is a space where you can bring people in, like in that mission circle. Um, you can have a circle that's the participants going through a process of applying collectively. You can really adapt it um, to grow, like Destiny spoke to earlier, the success rate of applicants. You can have a circle for applicants to sit in and learn what the process is like to prepare themselves to go next year. You have to navigate issues of consent and anonymity, but it's an opportunity to really design the circles based on what kind of education the people in your giving circle are asking for. If they're like, I've always been intimidated by numbers and like I zone out when I see anything that's on a spreadsheet or a chart, if, if they're open to learning and it would be supportive to your giving circle to have more people that can work with those forms, you can just have a training circle. Um, so the idea is that it's organic and it's self-determined. I think if you go to the next slide, I'll go through FIST of five quickly as a comparison, and then I'll leave you uh, in Destiny's hands to reflect on if this is useful to you and if these frameworks are addressing some of the questions that came up. Ooh, I see a question in the chat. How does this shift in decision-making impact how long it takes to make decisions? I'll answer that with this comparison. Thank you, Evan. So the FIST of five is actually what we use at our staff union. We just unionized at the Federation of Worker Co-ops and as a way to come through our decisions internally, um, we developed a different process. We don't have circles. We go through our decisions all together in one place. And the process starts in this top left with the green box. We present a proposal like we want to bargain on this issue or we want to ask for this accommodation. Um, ideally it's presented before the meeting. We go through a round of clarifying questions in the meeting, then we have a discussion, then we do a temperature check. Um, how are people feeling? And in the bottom left, you'll see that bubble that shows the what the one through five means. So we use a one like, hell no, I'm not about this. A two is no, but not a passionate no. A three is like, I'll go with the will of the group. I don't have a strong preference. A four is a yes and a five is a hell yes. And both sociocracy and this model have like a blocking mechanism in sociocracy, it's the objection, which gets integrated in rounds until you've worked through it. In this, it's a fist. So the fist means you have real concerns that it would be detrimental to make this decision and you're knowingly obstructing the process. So once we've done the temp check, which is optional, um, we ask people to share why they gave the number they did. We check in if we're ready for a vote and we vote. And our decision-making threshold, which is something you can determine is how many people need to say four or five for it to pass. You can have a goal of consensus, or you can have a goal of getting as close as possible, but really understanding the people who didn't vote yes. Ours is 80% fours and fives. If we get that, it passes. If we don't get that, it doesn't. But if there's 80% and a block, we still interrupt the process, but we appoint the person who blocked to create a problem solving team. So this is the moment where it resembles sociocracy. If the problem appears, the person who presents the fist or the block is assigned with coming up with an alternative. So it's not an option when you disagree with something to opt out. You're kind of making a commitment to finding something that works. And what I'll say about values is quite quickly that we encourage no matter what model you use to really emphasize the shared responsibility for the decision made in your circle, whether you're 100% behind it or not. Uh, that means supporting your fellow staff in the work, your fellow giving circle members in the research, regardless of if you personally think it wasn't the right call. This time to really reflect on that is both in the rounds of conversations in sociocracy or in this discussion round or in the evaluation when you just bookmark your objection and come back to it and say, I was really concerned that we were funding a group that was being torn apart by conflict or that was like helicoptering in from outside the community and sucking up funds. And it turns out I was wrong or it turns out I was right. So the last thing I'll say is that the emphasis on building in an evaluation for how is this decision landing? Did we achieve what we wanted is really important. And I'm not gonna go through it, but you have it as a quick reference, a comparison of which of these takes longer and which of these encourages or discourages anonymity. And you can look at that chart when you get the slides and I'll kick it to Destiny to close us out. Y'all, can we give a round of applause for all that information? 
<laughs> Thanks for the, the download, deep download. I'm really super passionate about both of these methods. I'm growing and learning the social accuracy, but the, the uni one, I'm like, ooh, ooh, exactly, Michael. Um, can we go to the next slide after this one? This is the reference that Marie was just making that y'all can look at, but because of time's sake, we want to move us to our closing reflections. That was a lot to download. So what we're wondering is, what questions will you bring back to your giving circle? What questions would you want to explore further with us if you had more time? So just take a moment and drop some responses in the chat. And I'll repeat it again. The questions are, what would you like to bring to your giving circle? And what would you like to further explore if we had more time? I know y'all are probably thinking of your responses. That's what I'm going to be thinking. As you're doing that, I'm going to just drop in the chat very quickly the evaluation form for today, which will also be sent to you via email by Kelsey. Thanks, Kelsey, for doing that in advance. And I'm going to drop this in the chat. Okay, that's the evaluation form, and I'm seeing in the chat. Ooh, 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 whoa, if you guys have responses, our board is reevaluating decision making models, so I'm excited to share this learning with them. Great. I bring back the question of reflection on how decision making is currently feeling as a regular practice. Yes, nice to have. I would like to get deeper understanding of FISTA 5 and how it compares to protocol we are currently using. Marie shared, I think the highlights of FISTA 5 are what it empowers. You see that? Cool, I'm gonna keep going to other responses. Marie responded there. Kelsey said, I am thinking a lot about how one would make the case to use these methods. Evan said, what is the interaction between process and equity? Good question to continue to think of. The concept of rounds, we'll love deeper, dive deeper into roles and how they can be distributed to leadership. There's a lot of curiosity still here in the chat. I'm not gonna read them all, but there is some of that is for there. I wanna keep us moving to think about how we're ending our time together. And again, thank y'all so much. Thank you for Lampathy together for inviting the Federation. I was about to say Marine and I, but it's really not Marine and I. It's really the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here. And it was such a nice opportunity to engage with you all, as well as just continue to share information that we are always trying to educate ourselves of and trying to move forward more equity in our decision-making processes. We wanna also share real quick with you ways to stay connected. Can you send the next slide? Yes, I dropped the eval in the chat. Let me drop it again in case, let me make it very clear that this is eval. Eval link, do, do, do. And I'll put an emoji here so you can find it easily. I'm putting the fire emoji. So if you look for the fire emoji, you should also see the eval. Here's how you can stay in connection with us. You have X, AKA, well, back in the day, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram here. And then um, if you want to connect with our consulting team, you can reach us at consulting at usworker.coop. If you want to reach the co-op clinic, you can reach the co-op clinic at clinic at usworker.coop. Big shout out here, just something to be aware of. If you're so interested in working with cooperatives, which I know y'all are probably hungry for, we actually have a conference this year that's happening. Um, so keep your eyes open for that and click on that link. And that is in September. Thinking about membership, like I said, we are a membership organization and these are different membership class. The two classes we think that the giving circles may fall in are worker or democratic workplaces as well as associates. So there's benefits of being a member at the Federation, such as a benefit of um, healthcare, as well as like being around other peers that can 
brainstorm with you around um, what your cooperative or the democratic workplace is doing. So I recommend you check out our website and I'm going to the next slide real quick. Here's a load of resources. Please, if you are hungry for more knowledge, because this was only an hour, I encourage you all to reach out to us at the Federation for more training support. And I encourage you to read what is a work of cooperative, read a bit about that, or the seven principles as Maureen had reference of cooperativism and more information about the two tools that Maureen had shared and enlightened us about. We could stop sharing screen, Jamie, so we can all see each other a bit more before we head out. Hey, all with no slides. Thank y'all so much for coming to this workshop and just opening your minds up and your giving circles to be more democratic. I know that you all are doing really great work in your communities. And yeah, I hope that this was informative for you and I will drop the eval one more time for you. And again, it will be shared by Kelsey. Maureen, is there any closing words you want to share? And then here's, here's the fire emoji. Is there any, no, nothing else, Maureen? Just thank you for holding the space with me. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Maureen, so much for holding space. And thank you, Jamie, for holding our tech and Kelsey for um, introducing us and kicking us off and inviting us, Kelsey. Thank you. Of course. Thank you all for coming. I hope you got a lot out of it. And if you're hungry for more, y'all, um, let me know and we'll see what we can build. We're always looking to serve you all. Um, and like I said, this was a training that I was incredibly excited for because collective giving has a lot to learn from worker cooperatives, as y'all can see. So within that, yeah, Chloe, I see you with the three hour comment. Destiny, Maureen and I felt that pain too. So if there are specific things that you're still craving that you think your giving circle could use or need, please feel free to email me directly and we can think about building out um, more content like this. My email is kelsey at philanthropytogether.org. Um, and as always, I love hearing from you all participants. And so with that, have a lovely day. I'll be staying online for a little bit just to make sure you all can get the eval. But happy Wednesday, y'all. Have a great evening. Peace. Bye, thank you. Bye. Destiny, if you want to hop, you can totally hop. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> sitting here too. <laughs> All right, Kelsey. Thank you again so much for reaching out to us. Yeah, I look forward to the debrief. We'll talk more. Cool. Oh, peace. Okay. Bye. Bye.